And um, a few weeks ago, or right after the last meeting, I did share with you that post from uh, Lazarillo and their partnership with uh, Bike Town. And uh, I think it was David to go out and test it. Uh, David Richard, right? Yes. Uh, sorry, I was unmuting. Uh, yeah. I did uh, have an opportunity to test it uh, during the course of my routine uh, field review duties. Um, so I was on. Um, I was reviewing stops along River Road in Milwaukee, um, a lot for the Line 32, and I was using it uh, to. I was walking between bus stops along that road. Um, and I was using it to locate, you know, the narrative. I, I also um, went out and used it out here in Washington County. And the first time I used it, it was amazing. And because it was announcing the streets as I was crossing. And then as I got up to the bus stop out there on Carmington Road, it did. It told me the bus stop. I was uh, rather impressed. It had the stop IDs uh, yeah. in the info page. and. Um, didn't have direction of travel, but at least you have the stop ID and you can, it's still kind of not, I mean, not a full solution though, because you do have to kind of use other apps to, to cross reference, but yeah, um, not bad. No, I, my, I was a little concerned because I, I went out to play with it again uh, the next day and I could not get it to announce. So, and I have not reinstalled it. So I'm not sure if that was a problem if my phone did an update that broke it or if Lazarillo is still glitchy. Um, you know, I have noticed one thing with it. I had to, so I would, you know, locate a bus stop and then it would track it. Um, but then if I wanted to locate another one, I found that I just needed to close the app and restart so that it could load. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, that's, you know, just another little tool. Tricia, I was wondering, would there be a time when people could meet that don't, it, it's hard for me anyway to know actually to know how it works and stuff to meet kind of like a field trip or something. That would be and kind I don't of fun. know. I don't know if we're thinking about doing that for some of the ad hoc committees, but it would sure help me, at least for a discussion. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And I don't know if other people have used it that are online, have it. So it's just an idea and it's still nice weather. It might be nice to, uh, especially in downtown where all things GPS tend to struggle with the tall buildings. It might be interesting to see how well it works on the, uh, on the mall. Um, as far as identifying the stops and what, what buses are at each stop. Um, so, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I agree. And maybe a few stops that uh, have fewer amenities that are harder to, you know, with fewer landmarks too, to see how to test that part out too. But that's the tricky part for me when you have a stop with little very few landmarks to begin with yeah where you find it yeah well that's that's uh well yeah i mean in fact that's my area i'm an incorporated washington county so it, it actually did um tell me that i was at the bus stop when i was right there and that was that was pretty cool i was i was impressed because <laughs> uh, we don't I usually get things that accurately out here uh-huh I'm sorry, Patricia. Um, I just sent the agenda to everyone on the call that I have an email address for. Um, so I'm sorry, Eric um, and Abby, I don't have email for you, but uh, it, I will happy, be happy to send it to you after the meeting. But I'm sharing the screen again. Okay. I just found... I'm sorry, guys. I just found... Uh... Andrew's email from earlier where he was delighted to announce. I want to see what it said. Mm. Delighted to announce. He's specifically talking about the stops on division that there have been changes made. Do you, does anyone know what that's about? I'm wondering, you know, on um, division with the FX going out there, I, I, I was going to uh, talk to Margo and Irene about us taking a trip out there um, and just kind of 
walking and rolling um down because there's lots of changes out there. I went on one of the, you know, the um before it actually starts, we were able to do that. Some of us, I don't know how many did it from CAT, but it would be really interesting to look at that, what Andrew's talking about, as well as the shelters and in between the stops, you know, things that we've just brought up all together um, to do that trip. Oh, here it is. They said that actually on division, they're using Braille on the signs. Um, yeah, it would be great to go out there. Yeah, it's just they've, that they've, they've Includes raised letters, raised letters, and braille on the signage on division, but it right. also says. The, he's saying the contrast that they're using though uh, is painful, and he's recommending the exact opposite of what we've always recommended. Um, yellow text on a black background. <laughs> um, that before, huh? You've heard that before, right? Yeah. The grays, yeah. Yeah. So, and did he talk about that they weren't in uniform? It wasn't, uh, they couldn't, he couldn't find them because they weren't placed in any uniform spot where everybody would know. That's pretty, that's, there. that seems to be system wide a problem. Yeah. He was yeah. mentioning, this is David, he was uh, mentioning that um, the poles were not immediately at the end of the uh, tactile warning surface indicator strips, uh, which are along. Yeah, and this is, of course, uh, the division transit project FX, um, and I believe those uh, indicators are really there because of due to the the BRT nature of the of the service, and you know having sort of that rail like feel to the platforms and with the amenities and so forth, and um, so I think that's why we're seeing those. And then there also are um, bike. Um, bike bypasses uh, behind some of the stops. So the uh, that where the bike lane runs in between the boarding and the lighting area and the sidewalk proper. And uh, there are uh, there is a, a, a very thin a little narrow um, in indicator strip uh, that in demarks those different areas. <laughs> It looks like uh, he thinks our point our meetings at four because he says I'm looking forward to joining you guys at four o'clock. Oh, <laughs> who is this? Uh, Andrew. Oh, okay. I'm in contact with him now. I was wondering, yeah, uh, that we may have to look at the time. Are you thinking just because he'll be in school? Doesn't it start next week? I don't know if he is already, but um, maybe four would be a better time if other people could make it. Yeah, school hasn't started yet. But... Next week, I think. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me go back to the agenda. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. I wanted to make sure I saw that. There it is. So, um, did anybody else have any chance? I mean, we've had a number of things that were shared, the stuff going on in uh, Canada. Did anybody have a chance to review any of that? Had anything you wanted to share about that? Eileen, you're muted. If you're trying to talk. Um, not about Canada specifically, um, although I found that all very interesting and Translate seems to be um, spot on and how they're applying it. But in Mass Transit Magazine, this week, there was an article about CTA in Chicago um, starting to do some of the same um, work with raised, raised, uh, Braille and raised letter signage at their stops with QR codes. Um, so it, it's definitely something that's on the radar of a lot of transit agencies right now. And the, I mean, I, you know, when I think about the transit centers and wayfinding there, finding your way from the train to the stop to the buses to getting out of there, <clears throat> that's a huge issue, uh, especially trying to find the correct bus. <laughs> 
Um, so I'm, I'm, but uh, I'm, I'm still in support of tactile maps at our transit stations. But the, the other piece that also um, has been an issue, and we've mentioned that this again with consistency is the location. Well, and this is actually more downtown in downtown Portland. The locations of the uh, card swipers, the are the hop card readers, so that they get activated before people get on the max trains. And I, and um, now I brought this up before, and I think others have as well. Um, I remember when they first started when they first added those, they wouldn't put hop card readers on the trains so that they could be swiped by people as they were entering because they wanted to make sure people were activating them and not just waiting to see the transit police show up to activate them. And TriMet's taken a friendlier approach towards that uh, in the last couple of years. Um, so I'm just wondering if that's something that we could revisit and get time TriMet to reconsider. It's on our list. Yeah. <laughs> um, I got it on the, the on the table that is on the second page of the agenda. Um, in the one, two, three, four, five, six, the row, which is at the bottom of page two, um, at bus stop and shelter design is listed there, including tactile walking surface indicators, octagonal pole with tactile signs real-time text-to-audio info at each stop and uniform location of hop card reader. It's not just the hop card readers that need to be in uniform locations. I'm a little bit concerned with the uh, learning that the Division Street does not have things uh, in consistent locations, uh, which will make things more challenging for people trying to use those stops. Yeah, I think Andrew uh, was brought that up to Anna. Um, I think that's a good thing we need to look at. Yeah, it's so, a different type of service too. It is a BRT service. It's not a normal fixed route service. So I anticipate it would be just a little different, but you would need to at least understand and know how to interact with it. I, I think that's important. So can I just a point of clarification with Anna's comment? Um, so are you saying that you just want consistent design of bus um, bus amenities but, or stop and station um, amenities so that whether it's readers or um, ticket vending machines or information that they should be in similar placement, they're different sizes, of, you know, locations, obviously, but I'm getting some consistency with those design standards. I just want to make sure I capture the right essence yeah. of what you're Consistency of locations of the wayfinding, I would think is important because otherwise you're still hunting for your way instead of being able to have something that's easy to, to find and recognize as being what you, uh, something that will be helpful to you. You know, a part of the issue is that um, people with low vision or uh, blind can't find the information they need to know where to get to where they want to go. And so a lot of people don't travel on their own because of it. And I, so I'm, in, I'm in total agreement. I just, Patricia was specifically mentioning the hop card readers. And so that's what my comment was about. So I wanted to make sure that the wholeness of your comment was accurately reflected, which is consistency of location of wayfinding tools, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Consistency throughout. Yeah, no, it's definitely important. I was just mentioning one by thing, you know, just this one specifically by name. <clears throat> I and, ask a quick question about the hop cards. Uh -huh. So if if a person doesn't tap in, but I like I have an annual pass, are they gonna put me in an arm bar if they check my ticket on the train if I haven't tapped in on that device on that on that piece of transit? Theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> I just wasn't sure because I'm constantly because I'm moving between multiple forms of transit on TriMet all the time. So I'm tapping on the bus, tapping on the max, tapping on the west. So I just wasn't sure if I can just tap once and get away with it. But I've been told to tap every time. So sometimes, as they said, trying to find, I just memorize them after a while. But that, you know, that doesn't yeah. work for everybody. 
No, and that's that's the concern is that yeah, you are supposed to tap it every time. And if you've already got an active fare, it's not going to matter. But if your fare is expired, then it'll charge you know the next time. Um, and yeah, if if you know they get carded <laughs> and they um, haven't activated their card, then it's a fine. Okay, thank you. Even if you know you've got the money on there. Is it is it outside of the art this purview of this group? Maybe it is, but to discuss like maybe a revised standard operating procedure for security officers in dealing um, or you know interacting with blind customers who have not tapped their card because it I mean it really is. It, you could, I mean, a blind person really could legitimately say, you know, look, I couldn't find it. Um, not even just downtown, but some of these other stations um, mm -hmm. are, they're difficult. It's difficult to find. And um, it's just, I don't think it's reasonable that, you know, to expect, um, you know, those cards to be tapped 100% of the time when we don't have the, the infrastructure in place to really um, help make, you know, make those cards. Uh, readers easy to locate. So I'm wondering, if, you know, maybe there should be some sort of SOP uh, that basically, you know, would prevent uh, any citations or or warnings from being issued to those uh, folks. Yeah. Uh, even though I, I know, you know, you, you know, you might still have a few people who blind people who do know where the card readers are, and obviously, you know, that's, you know, that is one thing. But I feel like the, you know, those. The benefits would outweigh the potential, you know. I completely fraud, agree. Until things are in, until the infrastructure is improved, anyway. Right. And and David, it's interesting that you mentioned this right now because Eileen, you know, she has an ERG with Mimi Bernal Graves, and they are actually looking at some type of training, um, so to to help. Is it the writer guides or those folks that are out there on the street better interact with people who have disabilities? So, no, this would not be the forum, but I think you might want to have a conversation with Mimi and Eileen offline. Definitely. It would definitely be more for the uh, for the fair inspectors and, um, you know, really, that's the, those are the folks, you know, the folks who are actually issuing the citations. But Absolutely. anyway, I'll, I'll uh, maybe, yeah, we can discuss that in another forum, but um, just a thought. No, I well, really appreciate you bringing that up, David, because it is important and it, it should be. David, if you could and, just tell him not to not to talk louder, that doesn't help me. But right? Yeah, that doesn't help. It's so crazy that people do that too. Right. No, like, right. Seriously, bro, I can't see very well. I can hear just fine. In fact, I can probably hear better than you. Yeah. We actually have that as a primer in the training that we're doing. And and David, um, your point is taken and well received, and I will make sure that not only. Does our on street um, writer support team um, get this information that we're working with the telephone writer support and I'll make sure that fair enforcement is included in that outreach. Awesome. So, I mean, our goal is to write up recommendations of things. That should happen. Obviously, we don't have budget control. We don't even have, you know, a budget. So. I've been viewing this as more of our our uh, our wish list. Hey, TriMet, can you do these things? Find the money. I mean, I, I noticed in in this agenda you listed potential funding sources like SDFAC. Um, but don't but forget, have, Patricia. We also have representative notes behind us true. on this initiative as well. So exactly. as we look at our common, you know, areas that where we go to look for money. He's also got, <laughs> he's got he some does work to have do. money. So, you <laughs> yeah, know, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we can say, Representative knows, come on, give us these beautiful tactile maps to every transit center. <laughs> <laughs> or he can definitely help us, you know, find out where we can, you know, where we can obtain yeah. that, those funds for sure. Yeah. I think. Go ahead. Somebody said, I think, and then they stopped. Yeah. I, I just was waiting for a break. Um, I've been, because when we talk about exclusively people that are fully visually impaired, we also need to remember that 
amenity location is important for low vision folks too, um, and also folks that just process the visual world differently. Um, and I, you know, I'm I'm one of those folks where my visual acuity is not perfect based on lighting conditions. Um, and and the other day I was at uh, Robinson uh, OHSU Dental School to try and get some work done, and um, I had to, you know, it took me about five or six minutes to locate the exact part of the, to locate the exact part of the platform where the uh, tap reader was, and I almost missed my bus. Um, and so that's why this stuff matters. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a, it's not only for people that have white canes in their hands. No offense against those folks, obviously, but it's, well, you're still it's, low vision, Ryan. It is. Yeah, exa thing. exactly. But but sometimes you may not know that. Um, yeah, unless someone shares that about their disability. Um, so I, I thought I would bring that up. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, it, oh, go ahead, Patricia. No, I'm just saying it's a, it's exactly that. Especially you know you're wanting to get to work, get to class, whatever. If the, if the choice is going back and forth on the platform, trying to find the uh, the place to tap your card or hopping on the train, you're gonna hop on the train. <laughs> anyway. Go ahead. Yeah, and I think that uniformity, Ryan, I was, you know, is so important too for older adults. You know, their yeah, their vision gets as you get older, as we all know, the vision gets worse and worse. But some sometimes it's difficult for them to speak out on that, and uh, you know, people sometimes don't want to say they have a disability or they're going um, their low their vision is getting worse. So it just helps a lot of groups. It does. I, I remember. Yeah. Now, when I was working at ILR, I get a lot of older uh, clients coming in and, and they would say things to me like, I am not disabled. I'm just old. I mean, they really, they would rather be called old than be told that they have a disability. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the exact yes. opposite. <laughs> but um, yeah. And I think Kat will be more involved now um, with the budget, um, at least according to our bylaws, it's executive. And like Margo was talking about looking outside of, you know, as well as, but I think some of these things can happen and we can put them on our budget requests for sure. Well, do we want to do can, something can like- Can you hear me? Uh-huh, oh, now can I can. Oh, if you were talking you. about- This is Janine. <laughs> this is Janine. I'm on the phone and I've been trying to unmute myself. Um, I just wanted to respond to the, um, the, the tapping stations, like for boarding the train. And one idea I had is, you know, for audible signals, the pole where they're located, the, the signal thing beeps so that you can find it. And I don't know why that kind of technology couldn't be used. I thought they did beep downtown. The problem is it's too noisy. You can't hear them. No, um, they don't beep continuously. I, I did see something like that in Chicago at uh, bus shelters. And the button that you wanted to press for the real-time arrivals, uh, text, you know, audible announcements would beep like a, um, similar to how a, a an audible pedestrian signal uh, beeps and, you know, quietly uh, so that, you know, you can locate it. That's what you're, I think that's what you're thinking of, right? Like a, a, every like second, like a beep, beep. Yeah. Yeah. That's what like, yeah, yeah, like, like the locators for the crosswalk uh, buttons. That's a cool yeah. idea. Yeah, they beep once you've tapped in. That's the only beeping I'm hearing. I, I I haven't been downtown in three years, so <laughs> but, um, I I thought at one point they were talking about adding locator beacons to them, but I guess that didn't happen I, early on when we were first talking about adding the hop card readers. But that yeah, I mean that is also an option, adding locator be button buttons to, beacons to them.
Eileen and I have been talking a lot about beacons recently. <laughs> seems like, well, it seems like it's a, it's an economical option. There's already an app in place. Um, so we've been talking about this a little bit. I don't know how much of a help it would really be for fixed route. I mean, not for fixed route, for um, paratransit, because of course they escort you to and from the door. But, yeah, that's not um, so much of a problem. Yeah, we, we, it would be nice if we maybe had a, a possible uh, pilot of some sort just to see how well that would work. But yeah, that, I mean, I mean, the thing is, is that if these things were in place, you'd have fewer people using the lift because they would they would feel safer, more comfortable traveling, more self sufficient and independent. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a huge. I mean, the fear of getting lost is is real. <laughs> you know, like missing the last bus home or whatever. Um, so. One of the things I was thinking here, I mean, as far as like we write up these recommendations, do we want to like focus on a uh, like a test spot, like pick a location and say, hey, can we do these things to this transit center, to this set of streets, whatever, to 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 see how it works? I mean, what are your what are your thoughts, everybody? I, I think it's always valuable to have a proof of concept. And if there is a specific area, I mean, I think any priorities, um, I should back up and say, this is Eileen. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the service delivery and eligibility manager for the LIFT program. Um, but, you know, we're working on some pilot projects to prove that they are successful in other parts of LIFT right now. And I think anything that we may want to take system wide, um, it's always helpful to make sure one, not just that it's is successful for the agency, but it's the right tool that will help you get your needs met and that we don't make this huge investment system wide only to find out that it's really not as good as we hoped it would be. So I think if we can prioritize a, a route or locations, or maybe if it's, um, you know, a, a whole alignment of platforms, that's the red line, we'll, we'll do those platforms or a subset of those, anything we can do to narrow the scope will make it much more achievable in the short run. Um, and it will control those costs so that we'll, we'll have a good case to make moving forward that it was successful and we can extrapolate the benefits to the rest of the system. Yeah, okay. And so my thought here is that if we focus on a test area near the Commission for the Blind, as you have students regularly going through there that are going getting mobility and things like that. so like the Belmont stop for buses um, and then that the, the transit center over there on, uh, is that the Hollywood? What is that transit center? That's um, Rose that Quarter. Ro the, the one from 12th, you go down, which stop is that? Is that? Oh, uh, that uh, that's, well, the Max station that's closest to the commission is uh, Holiday Park. Yes, uh, that's the one. Um, I was, I was going to uh, suggest Rose Quarter because it is so um, complex. It is complex. So that would be harder. Yeah. yeah. But I think that I, you know, I remember I talked to um, a mission instructor, an L&M instructor, and he actually told me uh, that he does not uh, teach his clients how to use the Rose Quarter. Uh, and instead, it recommends that they cross the river in, to transfer in on the transit mall because, um, in his opinion, the Rose Quarter is not accessible. Um, mm. And so, it, I just, you know, it seems like it, that, I mean, because you have different platforms in different areas that are off street and that don't have a, any real, you know, that would, that don't have like the landmarks that you would for a street. So it's, it would be more challenging to navigate um, in an off street area, but if maybe that would be a good, maybe, maybe that would be a good test subject. I, I don't know. It, it's that, I mean, that does definitely... make it a, a transit center that even uh, O and M instructors are saying, this is just too unbearable. It does definitely sound like the ideal place to start. <laughs> I I would I would just if I don't think I did come out yeah. 
uh, when I'm huh? transiting to when I'm when I'm going to the commission because I go to the commission three days a week and I transit via the blue or red line up to seven. I don't go up to Holiday Park just because it's not safe up there. So I drop off at seventh and hike down from there. Seventh is a pretty standard type of a max platform. There's a little bit of challenges there, but maybe that'd be a good spot because it's there's there's not a lot going on there, but just enough to be entertaining. <laughs> and I, I, I agree with you. it's probably probably James that was talking about the Rose Porter. I, I don't go to Rose Porter unless I have to because it is kind of a choose your own adventure thing there. So yeah, yeah it was James. I um yeah. I have definitely when I go there I use the uh I use an app to um you know put in a, a beak is a you know to put in a location in the Rose Quarter as a beacon and I've had to save my own locations and um so it, it's definitely a um yeah it's really really tricky especially james, with james is yeah. the o m wizards for sure so seventh is a good idea i mean i usually God, i haven't been over to the commission forever but yeah um i usually got off downtown and took the just went across on belmont on the bus on the 15 and just walked up yeah, from the there yeah yeah, the problem the problem right this second with Belmont and Morrison is there's a huge amount of construction right at the bus stops on both sides mm -hmm. of um they're putting up a giant another high rise right there. That's the only that's a well, I guess that would be a good challenge, but it might might be a little tough as a it give people excuses to say this is my so. Yeah. Trisha Andrew just came in. Hi Andrew. Hello. We were looking at your email and congratulations for, you know, being a, a trendsetter and getting things moving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sorry, I'm I thought the meeting was at four. So. Oh, no. No, that, that is not me, Andrew. That's not <laughs> your. That's not your fault. That's the old lady over here. So, um, you're good. We're just glad that you could join. <laughs> And Andrew, we were questioning uh, when do you start school and what time will you be getting out for, so that we can schedule future meetings at an appropriate time? I start school August 31st and my school ends at 3.30. Oh, will you be Good. home by 4 if we do schedule a 4 o'clock? Would you be home by then? Um, usually unless there's a band, uh, guitar, or something. Yeah, usually unless I have an extracurricular activity. Okay. Maybe we may need to find another day other than Friday and I can work it out with you and your dad and figure out what's a, a good day that may work for everyone here. But we'd love yeah. to keep you involved because you've got some great feedback. Do you get do you have an earlier release day or is it the same time every day? Uh it's the same time every day. Oh. Okay. Okay. All right, we will keep that in mind. And again, my apologies for uh, typing the wrong uh, time frame on that meeting line. That was on me. Okay, we're at 341. So, Andrew, what we were just talking about was identifying a um, location uh, to kind of recommend that they they do a, uh, God, my words are escaping me because it's the end of Friday, <laughs> a test, a test run to, to with our dudes, just, you know, so that we can see how they improve things, get some feedback from uh, the public. Um, yeah. Seventh, the, the seventh street stop. Um, is that Lloyd Center? No. Um, I know, I'm sorry, I, I like, don't go out there anymore. Um, anyway, uh, of the max, we were thinking about that. Um, my thought was to focus on uh, the area by the, com and, and if you have other ideas, let me, let me know around the Commission for the Blind, because that's where a lot of students and travel are of people that are blind trying to access services. Sounds great. And Patricia, can I um, just uh, ask a, maybe a point of order? Um, mm -hmm. If we are going to um, have a test location, could we maybe set some priorities for which of these initiatives are the most important and sort of work down that list? So I don't know if you are wanting to test everything all at once 
or isolate and make one change at a time and determine the efficacy of that one element and then look to add things or, or what, what? Yeah, no, I is. definitely, yeah, no, I do think we need to prioritize that. I just thought we should set a location first that, that we could start, you know, I was just trying to get a starting point. <laughs> yeah, fair, but, fair enough. Yeah. Um, so yeah, because we have made a lot, but there, I mean, all of these recommendations are important uh, and we, we need them all. We need tactile wayfinding. We need. Uh... Um, I don't know if you all have discussed this already, but there's uh, some improvements on Division Street, actually, with the new bus stops that they're implementing. Yeah, we were reading your email. I'm curious about you were saying. Um, so they already have screens or uh, signage with with Braille and raised letters. That was that was a new uh, that was breaking news. Um, and you said that I, I I did have a question for you, so I'm glad you're here because you said that the they were tactile markers, uh, but they had barriers with bike racks. Can you explain what that what you meant by that? I meant that bike racks were either too close or nearly in the way. So when you're using your cane or just walking, you could hit one of the bike racks. There's, um, yeah, I sent a picture. Okay. It would be great again to go out on division and look at some of the things that we're talking about that are actually in place now as well. Yeah. And we can get these back to the cap capital projects team and see right. if there's anything they can do to make some modifications. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just thinking, I mean, when you mentioned that, the first thing that came to mind was that area outside the Smith Center at PSU. And I was totally unfamiliar with that area and trying to figure out how to get from those doors to the curb to catch my Uber. And there's just endless bikes. <laughs> A nice young stranger helped me figure out how to get around them because the, the uh, Uber driver was just shouting from the street. He wasn't going to be any help. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's, that's, those are good points. So are we looking at an outing for the next meeting, Patricia, before the weather starts? That might, um, or well, not. the problem is, well, I mean, that would be good if we can maybe do, but I mean, it will have to be kind of late because of Andrew's school schedule. He's starting school next week. Um, well, unless we, <laughs> unless we all worked on the weekend, I was um, going to let you say that, Patricia. We <laughs> we could all do Labor Day. <laughs> oh. Um. One thing about the tactile walking surfaces is that um, if we could change the color from white to yellow, that would be like that. I feel like that would be much more. It'd be there'd be better contrast, and since it sometimes snows in Portland, I feel that it wouldn't blend in as much with the snow if it was yellow. Also, um, yeah, I I really like how the tactile walk surface indicators go from the street to the actual signs. Um, even though some stops yet are yet to have the signs, and some are placed inconsistently, I like how they go. From the street to the sign. Oh, yeah, we yeah. actually discussed uh, the color of the tactile areas and the fact that uh, I, at one point it had been defined that they should be yellow. And uh, because the white, when it gets dirty, you, you can't see it as well. And, you know, under certain weather conditions, it, it's not right. And so uh, we have discussed that. And so yeah, I and super sunny honest. days, it's painful. And I'm I'm uh, sad if they have used the white on Division Street uh, because we have been talking about it for quite some time, a couple of years that I'm aware of. It, it was a discussion when I came on to this committee ten years ago. It's it's been a decades old discussion, and I'm not sure why there's so much pushback against it. Maybe they got a discount on the white paint. 
Patricia, I was wondering if we should find out, even if that's a possibility of, of I mean, everything's possible, but as you know, this has been a huge, huge issue for Cap for a long time. I know. We we Michael Levine would be smiling from heaven if we could oh, change I those know. colors. Oh, well, uh, because, the, yeah, as, as somebody who formerly sighted uh, with low vision uh, on a, and, and lived in Southern California, white paint on a sunny day hurts. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. you need that softer uh, and yet contrast of uh, the yellow. Well, I'm not sure exactly who made the change because I actually, myself and here's an old name from the past, Dion Graham, were both on the division project at the very beginning of the design phase. And we, it was agreed that they would be using yellow. Right. So, I, so somewhere along the line, I'm not sure why it changed up. It did, but I can definitely inquire was, and uh, find I, out if it can be changed. Weren't we told it was somebody from the city that keeps changing it? Yeah, we were told that the city city didn't, and actually, we did get some changes, Margo, up here by Portland State when that was coming the max a long time. But then you're right; it went back, and it was Peabot. I mean, Peabot was involved in it. I don't know who made the uh, final one, um, but okay. was involved in it. Well, well I, I was. Here. I seem to recall being told they were the reason they would not let us do yellow. Lisa Strader's online and has her hand up. Oh, so we have Lisa. Here. Hi, Lisa. Hi, can you can you hear me and see me? Yes. Yes, yes. ma'am. Yes. For anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Lisa Strader. I'm Portland Bureau of Transportation's ADA coordinator. And um, we talk about tactile domes a lot and always talk about yellow. Um, so I would be very interested to know who at Peabot is telling anybody that they need white, not yellow. <laughs> um, and I um, would be happy to try to be helpful in um, making those changes. I, I honestly am not going to be able to commit that I can change what's there now, but certainly going forward, if if they're being placed and they're not yellow, um, I mean, I'd love to talk to whoever thinks that they need to be something other than yellow, um, because that's never a conversation I've been a part of. Which doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but. Lisa, do you guys have something in your design standards that you could share with us that we could share with climate engineering and construction to demonstrate that the city at least has a standard that we could be aligned with and consistent with at TriMet? Eileen, this is Lisa again. That's a really good question. I know that our standard for curb ramps is yellow, and I don't know that we have a standard for um, more of a tactile strip because we we actually, as Peabot, don't put them in place very often. So, um, so there is reason to believe that since we don't since we may not have a standard and we don't do it very often that somehow somebody thought white was a good idea um so i will that's a really good suggestion though eileen i will look to see if we have a standard um and um are you using the standard them is i'm sorry, I'm sorry oh i'm i was just asking lisa if you're using tactile strips along the festival streets where there's no delineation for pedestrians yeah, and Patricia, vehicles. this is Lisa again. We, I know that we use them between, um, um, like on a shared use path between bike and ped um, lanes, and those are yellow. Okay. Um, so that's like a continuous strip down a pretty long route. And again, we don't have very many of those yet. Um, those plaza areas, uh, for the most part, don't have anything permanent like that yet. Um, we are making some of the plazas more permanent, but to my knowledge, we haven't put any kind of guidance, um, permanent guidance like a tactile strip in those plazas. But really good questions. I should be sure that I circle back to people who are working on those and ask if we're doing anything like that. Another point I want to make on the design phase is also the 
is also the obstructions uh, along the tactile strip. And I feel that the people who are actually constructing them should close their eyes and walk down from the street to where the sign is proposed to be, walk down the path to check if there's any obstructions that could be of worry. Lisa, the one with Peabot, you might want to check with is April. April has a long history. <laughs> Great, thanks, uh, Jan. This is Lisa again. Yeah. I will talk to April. She's out until sometime next week, but April and I are coworkers, and um, yeah. I can ask her about that. She is yeah. one of the people that's in conversations with me where we consistently talk about using yellow. So, um, again, not that doesn't mean that we didn't come up with someone didn't come up with some reason they thought was valid to use white, but um, those conversations. And she just has a history. Can maybe know you know give you a little more background. Great. Yeah, Great she's idea. been around a while. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, we're making a little bit of progress. Um, so we, um, I do think, um, Eileen, that definitely braille signage and tactile markers and appropriate contrast is, is an important priority to start with whatever test a location we use. Patricia, Dave just came on. Hi, Dave. Hey. Um, well, I apologize that some people were told this meeting was at four. <laughs> it was at three. It was at three. <laughs> Blame it on me. I'm sorry, Patricia. Could you re could you repeat um, the three things that you just mentioned that were the priorities, and are those in the order that you would like them to be prioritized? Well, that's up for the the whole committee. But uh, so I, I wanted to get that through to everyone. So if we prioritize, uh, obviously, I mean, we're talking about wayfinding for blind and low vision. So tactile tactile wayfinding is obviously a priority. Uh, appropriate um, color contrast for low vision. Uh, and um, in, increase uh, braille signage. And, and I think, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Um, I think that it make, you made a good point that we need to add some standardization as to where these machines yeah. are so that you don't have to go searching for them. Exactly. I mean, these other things are also very important, getting the the automatics, you know, announcements on Max fixed so that that we aren't having the ongoing headaches we are with that. But um, that needs to be prioritized. <laughs> but in, in this demo location, um, we need to, you know, that's more approaches, wayfinding to and from the, the vehicles. So, okay. yeah, I think. I think we could absolutely have two separate buckets of, of uh, I'm using um, air quotes to say current features, although they're malfunctioning. So that mm -hmm. is, those are systems that have been budgeted and the, the maintenance and upkeep of those ought to be factored into the ongoing operation. So if we mm -hmm. have things like the audible announcements that just aren't working right, that's potentially less of um, an ask just to have things working that should have been working all along versus new technology. So I think it's safe to have them in two separate buckets. It'll be two different teams working on them potentially. Right. And um, I, I, Eric, I know you mentioned this. I just, I'm trying to figure out which one that is. You mentioned the 7th Street Center. Um, yeah, it's Northeast 7th. I, I actually had the, let me pull up the stop ID because I have it saved on my phone. It's, um, Stop ID 8375 is the, I guess that'd be the westbound stop on the north what, side. What else is there? What is at that location? Well, th that's not... near, it's just before Lloyd Center if you're heading east and, and it's uh, Multnomah. At, it, is it? Is that the street that it is? Is that Holiday. the, okay, is that the one where the hotel Holiday. is? Okay, yes. there you go, Holiday that's... Street. The, the okay, so that, that is the one I was thinking of where the, where the double tree is or whatever it's called these days. Yeah, it's between the between the convention center and Lloyd Center. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a great location and that's pretty busy. Um, maybe we should, maybe that's a good place for us to schedule an in-person field trip meeting so that we can all take a look at it. And maybe that way we can get a clear idea of, of things that we feel should be prioritized to make it better. Patricia, I just want to be sure that you know, um, I, and I think I'm correct on this. I'm, but the where the hotel is a double tree is by the park. The one before that, I believe, is Seventh Street. And remember the building where TriMet used to we used to hold meetings at. Um, and then the uh, close also to the hotel that you can see the whole city on the top that you and I have been to. Um, but it's closer to the convention center. It's a stop after the convention center. After, yeah, going out, going east. Right. It's not It's not the one by the double tree, unless the hotel's changed its name. Double tree is by the park. Okay. I, I always thought that was the Lloyd Center stop. Um, but okay, I, I was just trying to think because uh, I don't know what else is around there because I I don't travel in that area anymore. <laughs> so I was trying to think of something that was going to be a busier stop that was going to get lots of use. Yeah, there's all those new apartments. Um, well, the Lloyd Center stop would uh, by the Double Tree would be busier, I think. A uh, lot yeah. of people there. It's just by that that park. Mm. Yeah, and I. What do you guys think? Which which guy? Which what do you guys think? Well, if we're gonna do one of the match stations on Holiday Street, we I would recommend doing the uh, Lloyd Center because um, there is the transfer point between the uh, Max and Line Seventy. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. That's and that's a good point. That would be really helpful. All right, do we want to go there then? Do we want to go hang out at Lloyd Center and check out the. Not, yeah. not, at, Holiday, not at Holiday Park, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. What? That is the stop. That's he doesn't the like park, Holiday so. Park. Yeah. <laughs> if it's late They're enough, not. there's a great happy hour across the street at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm with you, Jan. Jan, <laughs> we have a minor on the phone. <laughs> oh, but they have good food. Yeah, but you can't <laughs> let minors in. They won't yes, let them exactly, in. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, they will let minors in there. Uh, I was going to say, if, well, places that serve food should allow minors, too. Uh, for, for they do. Now, oh, no, I know that at the, the River Place, uh, in the bar, because uh, we had a person watching dogs that was under 21, and they kicked them out. Yeah, no, they, we've take, I've taken young people there after going places It's that are too young. They bring their kids, but it's nice. <laughs> oh, good. I don't know what this place is. That sounds good. Double tree. Okay. So what we're looking at is, are we going out to this location to look at the area? Is that what we're planning for our next journey here? Journey here. Yes. We're planning a field trip. Okay, so Lloyd Center, and you said I'm not I'm not the Portland person. That's Eileen and everybody else. Dave? Yeah, it's not me. <laughs> it's definitely not me. But parking is good. well. There's parking at the Double Tree. Yeah. Dave, I thought you had a question. No. Oh, no, no, just I, raised his hand that you were good with that. Okay. No, I think I it, rested my elbow on the uh, wrong place or something. <laughs> okay. In, in non-pandemic times, that double tree is a pretty popular place for uh, various disability-focused conferences uh, and things. So, as far as accessible, you know, people needing accessibility, it's 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 pretty big there. Yep, the restrooms are good and. If you have to pay for parking there, but I'm not sure on that. All right. Well, we will work on getting this uh, road trip together uh, for next month, and we'll get out there and take a look and ask questions and get the information that we need.
Oh, uh, this is Andrew. One more thing about the funding. I just mm -hmm. got an email from Representative Rob Noss, and I actually sent this to you, but he sent me some links on how the TriMet budget, how, like, the TriMet budget plan. Survey. And there's a, a survey and everything. How do you suppose? Yeah, I, I got that information. Saw yesterday. that. Yeah. So, yeah. Andrew, you wouldn't happen to have any, like, teacher in service days already on your schedule, would you? <laughs> <laughs> just kind of make so. it days you don't have school because then we can go out there earlier. <laughs> Not so, um, but okay. Uh, um, and can we put the bus routes with go there? What bus routes go there, and if people need that to get there? The max lines all go there. Yeah, the max in the seventy. 70. <laughs> Eight, um, line eight and 77 are on uh, Multnomah Street, um, which is a parallel uh, a block away. And then I'm trying to remember what else is over there. You could take the line six if you're coming from MLK and walk a few blocks. Um, the 17, if you're really, if you're coming from that area, um, from like, of where it runs, I think those are the main. I can't think of any others off the top. And of the head. seventy, right? Yeah, the seventy is the one that intersects uh, the right. max at, at that location, and going from the commission. So yep. that would be it goes a, to yeah. the commission. Yep. Um, so we might want to look at that, and it might be that might be if we're going to do this location, then yeah, that could you know look at some of the bus stops around it, the max to you know see if we have any recommendations for wayfinding. To and from the different, yeah, can points. Sounds good. I have to give uh, this group a little orientation on the uh, on the uh, trip planner. I can tell already. So, uh. oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other subject. Can we make the trip planner more accessible? <laughs> that's exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I got my hand up so I can request that this field trip not be the last Friday of the month. I have an obligation out here in Forest Grove on that afternoon on those afternoons. And uh, so I'd like to request that it be uh, a different day uh, other than the last Friday of the month. Absolutely. I think I think we may actually move these originally when they were put on the calendar. It was with the idea that also we would have TriMet staff in these meetings, but we're took them all off because basically they don't need to come on board until the press until the uh, recommendation is made. So I think we may have a little bit more flexibility with time and dates. So absolutely. We'll take care of that. Anna. Thank you. You are welcome. Sounds good. Okay, then I think unless there's anything else, I think we can go have a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank right, you everybody done. again. Apologies for the mistake in the um, time. But again, I'm glad that Andrew, you were able to get on. Dave, it's always good to see you. Um, everybody have a great weekend and we will get some materials out to you shortly as to our field trip next month. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks, y'all. Bye-bye.